Hi, thank you for checking out sciencevideos.org. Um, today we're talking to Dr. Kittle about his work on territory size and pack size according to habitat quality. So, Dr. Andy, um, what can you tell us about your work? Okay, well, this paper in particular is uh, is focused on one of the well, a central question in sort of in ter territorial carnivore ecology, which is uh, it's well known that territorial carnivore density um, scales quite effectively with the quality of the habitat. Um, but of course, density means the number of individuals in a given area, right? So the thing is that this can result from one of two things. This can either be an increase in the number of individuals within a pack, or this can be the result of uh, a shrink in the pack, uh, of the actual territory of the pack, given an increase in uh, habitat quality. Uh, so what this study was was aiming to do was to try to tease these two things apart. So this was a large scale uh, study that was that we we conducted up in northwestern Ontario in Canada. Um, one of the unusual things about it well, was that scale. We looked over a study area, well, two study areas, each of which was some twenty thousand square kilometers. Um, altogether, we had thirty four for this paper itself. We had uh, thirty four wolf packs with radio collars in them, which was a total of about 52 individual wolves over the course of three uh, winters. Um, and so what we did is we amalgamated individual movement um, that we got from the radio collars. So the radio collars record uh, the movement of the individuals as they go every couple of hours. Um, and what you can get from that is kind of a use of the landscape, how these animals are using the landscape. So we took these individual uh, measures that we had and we actually amalgamated them together um, into this population level uh, utilization distribution. So basically it's a measure, it's a map of, of areas of use and areas of high use and low use by wolves on this landscape across a broad, broad area. Um, and then what we did is we, we ran a model using with a number of ecological environmental variables um, that might be relative that might be uh, relevant to uh, wolf landscape use, and we incorporated those into the model and and created a model which kind of gave us the areas that wolves preferred compared to areas they don't. So, for instance, this model indicated that wolves were were selecting for areas on the landscape which where there was a high proportion of uh, deciduous forest, where there was a lot of disturbed forest. Um, they avoided areas of lowland. Now, these first two categories are typically associated with their pr preferred for prey, which is moose, the type of forage that moose prefer. So they were linked with that. Uh, wolves were also selecting areas in the landscape where linear corridors were moving through, so river areas as well as roads. Um, so we first of all did this, this large-scale model. Then we projected the output of that model across even broader area of the landscape which then finally kind of gave us an idea of areas of high probability of wolf use, essentially, compared to areas of low probability of wolf use. Okay, so then what we did is we then took the individual territories of individual packs, of which, I, like I said, we, we ended up with 46, I think, of them for this paper, um, and we looked at the 50%, the core area, right, within, the, within that home range, as well as almost the full home range, and then for each of those, we determined the probability, the average probability of wolf use that we had got from our model that we have previously overlaid across the landscape. Um, and then we also, we took some of the actual individual habitat uh, land cover types, such as deciduous forest, disturbed forests that were preferred, that we considered therefore to be good quality habitat. Um, and we took the proportion of each of those home range areas that included that type of uh, habitat. Then finally, we used a completely independent measure of moose density, which was estimated from a separate model, which did not go into our wolf, our, uh, our wolf land use model at all. Uh, so this is a separate metric where we basically did the same thing. We estimated areas of high probability of moose use compared to low probability. And again, each wolf home range and both the core and the total area were then uh, uh, an, an average moose probability was, was put for that as well. So therefore, each of these ranges, 50% uh, and 95%, uh, then had a measure of the total probability of moose use, total probability of wolf use, as well as some of these habitat categories, right? And then, <laughs> so then what we did, if you're still with me now, is, uh, is that we just, we ran our regression. So we basically did a correlation. We linked up 
Um, the size of each of those individual ranges, the territory size. Well, first of all, what we did is we, we linked the density, right? Because we first wanted to make sure that we were getting this relationship that, that, that we expected to have higher density and a better quality. So we linked that up and we, sure enough, as we, as we expected, we saw that um, there, were, there were more, the, the, the density of wolves within uh, high, better quality ranges was higher, right? So then what we did is we went and looked at that we did the same thing with both the pack size and the territory size, right? And so we, we got strong relationship between territory size and the habitat quality from all these different habitat quality metrics that I just previously went through. And basically it was an inverse relationship showing that as habitat quality increased, range size decreased, right? So wolves are using smaller ranges when the habitat quality was better. Whereas when we looked at the actual pack size, um, we found no relationships. So what this indicates is that wolves are adaptively altering their space use behavior and not their, uh, not their demographic sort of structure uh, according to local habitat conditions. Um, and that was, that's sort of the main, the main thrust of this, of this paper, which has some ramifications, obviously, for wolf ecology and predator-prey interactions and things like that. Thank you. That was brilliant. Um, a couple of questions now. So, um, do you think that this behaviour of pack size and territory size, according to habitat quality, do you think it's unique to the Canadian wolves, or do you think it's applicable to different wolves from different geographical locations? I mean, we would expect this to be applicable fairly widely. Um, I mean, you know, whether it's applicable also to other species is also an, a, a question of interest. Um, but, but I would certainly think that it is for wolves. Uh, one of the interesting things, again, about this uh, outcomes of this research is, is another question is, okay, well, now if we're not seeing pack sizes being changed according to habitat quality, why do pack sizes change? What it, you know, what, what does impact that? So while we didn't find any, we weren't looking for that specifically in this paper, we, by not finding any relationship between pack size and habitat quality, it kind of strengthens an argument which exists, which indicates that pack size is driven more by uh, intra-specific intra competition, so competition between wolves and other wolves. And that's been shown in some other studies which indicate that, you know, when you've got a high density of wolf packs, not necessarily density of wolves, but a high density of packs together, um, you have larger packs, which might help to, you know, combat each other and kind of keep a territory, that sort of thing. Anyway, that's a bit of a side note. <laughs> <laughs> that's still interesting. Still interesting. Uh, so, so this research, this research has an impact on the conservation of wolves. I mean, it, it does have the potential to, yeah, for sure. Um, because obviously when you're looking at conservation and management, you need to know relationships between predator and prey. I mean, that's a basic one, right? Um, so knowing how wolves maybe adapt their, their, their behavior spatially or demographically, in this case we're finding spatially, uh, to, to changing habitat qualities might give, a, give an indication of what to expect uh, given certain scenarios. Um, so it definitely does have management and conservation implications, yeah. Um, you mentioned as well that this was um, a very large scale study. Um, just some logistical problems. I mean, how long does it take to perform a study like this? I mean, sure, there's a lot of data here, so it must have took quite a while, I imagine. Yeah, I mean, that was, again, one of the unique things that makes this such a rich, rich data set, um, unusually rich, right? This was a sort of multidisciplinary um, project. Uh, so it involved Canadian government agencies, it involved no, a, a number of universities. It was conducted over three years. Like I said, there was actually three study sites. I focus on two study sites within, within this paper, but there were three large study sites. Um, so yeah, the logistics was immense. To get 54, or, you know, 54 wolves radio collared over a number of years over the, in the winter and the summer to track all those guys. There was also caribou that were radio collared you know, 120 caribou. We did moose surveys over wide, wide areas. So it did. It took a lot of people coordinating a lot of stuff. And obviously, it took funding from a number of agencies as well. So that is one of the real, real unusual strengths of this paper, I think, is that, that amount of data that we have to work with. Yeah. So um, some questions to you now. I mean, what's next for you personally? What's your next research challenge? What are you looking into next? Personally, I mean, I'm a, I am a carnivore biologist, so I'm, stick, I'm sticking with carnivores. Um, 
but I've and I've done some work again at, at the same sort of time with sort of li with lions and hyenas in the Serengeti, looking again at sort of again social carnivores and how how their space use is affected by prey availability. That was kind of the theme of a lot of the work I've done recently. But I also uh, run a project with my wife in Sri Lanka, which focuses on leopard research. So now we're down to uh, solitary carnivores. Um, and so we do a lot of work, uh, basic ecological work on that with a sort of conservation management bent as well in Sri Lanka. So we have a trust called the Wilderness and Wildlife Conservation Trust, if anyone's interested. <laughs> So thank you very much. Um, the link to the paper that we've been discussing today is below this video, as well as some links to this uh, leopard project um, as well. So thank you, Andrew. You've been brilliant, and it's been lovely to talk to you. Thank you. You're more than welcome.